Amen. You may be seated. Open your Bibles there to Luke, book of Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. While you're turning there, I came across this. thought some of you might uh, enjoy this. Daniel Webster. Daniel Webster. How many of you remember Daniel Webster? Nobody remembers Daniel Webster? Come on now. I was going to say, Lord, help us. <laughs> Daniel Webster made a call upon John Adams. How many of you remember John Adams? Nobody remembers John Adams? Amen. Amen. Daniel Webster made a call upon John Adams before he died. Webster asked Adams how he was getting along. Adams replied, very well. The top is all off the house. We know about that, don't we, brother? The top is all off the house, this up here. The windows are getting dim, these right here. The foundation is very shaky. <laughs> and as far as I can see, the landlord does not aim to take or to make any more improvements. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, I'm doing fine. <laughs> oh, man. This old body wears out, don't it? Foundation gets shaky. The windows get dim. Things get thin on top. Someone told me the other day, Preacher, you're getting thin. I forget it was one of the boys or something. I said, Shut up. Get out of here. But I don't care. Yeah, I don't. I really don't care. You know what? Make it bald. It wouldn't bother me at all. It might bother her, but it wouldn't bother me at all. Big cue ball. I'd really blind you up there now, up here now. These new lights. You say, you're about doing it now. Well, that's all right. Hey, Amen. One of these days, I'm going to get a brand new body. I'm going to have a head full of jet black hair. Amen. Amen. Just like Jesus Christ has. Amen. Aren't you glad he's coming to get us? Aren't you glad this ain't all we got to look forward to? Man, if this is all you had look forward to, you'd be, you'd be of all men most miserable. Amen. Luke chapter 12, I'm going to preach on the subject of a wasted life. A wasted life. Now, we've got people in here of all ages. Some, some are just getting started. And uh, some haven't even started yet. They're still on the way, you know. Uh, but some, some are just getting started. Some are in the middle. And uh, some are uh, at the end. <laughs> Bad as you, we don't want to admit that or whatever. Uh, down close to the twilight years or the end. And, and, uh, but you know something? The Bible talks about uh, what is your life? It's a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. It doesn't, life is short. Life is very short. I, I someone, you know, was talking the other day about how old we were and ages and all that. I'm 50 years old, soon to be 51. I'm like, good night, where'd the time go? And I'm thinking, you know, 20 years, I think about 20 years. I think about 10 years, I think, that ain't nothing. 10 years ain't, don't seem like nothing, you know. And then I think, oh, my soul, in 10 years, I'll be 60. <laughs> 20, I'll be 70, just in 20 years. Like, no, slow down. But it, it don't slow down, does it? It just keeps on going. And I think about all that and think about uh, stuff. And, you know, I don't want to waste my life. I don't want to waste it. And um, I can look back, and maybe there was some time back there, maybe in all of our lives, you look back and say, well, I didn't do much there. And I didn't do much there. And could have done a little more in that particular time of my life or whatever. But... Uh, as far as my life in general, I don't want to waste it. And there's a man here in Luke chapter 12, he, he, as far as I'm concerned, he wastes his life. He wastes his life. I remember the Honey Bee Quartet singing years ago. How many of you know who the Honey Bee Quartet is? Yeah. Oh, amen, amen, that's all right. Uh, they're, they're good stuff, amen. And uh, they used to sing that song, Wasted Years, Wasted Years, Oh How Foolish. And uh, that's the good, good stuff, and make you think. And, um, but t so many people today, they do, they just waste their life. What, I mean, what is there to life if all you do is go to work? And you devote your life to that company, 
and now we see today, okay, if you don't take the vaccine, we're, we're firing you. <laughs> That's what they think of you. <laughs> Amen. Well, who cares? I'm not talking about debate whether for or against, all that stuff, whatever. I'm just telling you, they, let, they throw a mandate down. They don't care. They'll replace you just like that. Amen. Amen. And there's people out there, you know, devoted to the company. And I'm not against, you know, I mean, if they hire you to do eight hours work, then do eight hours work. Amen. Be a good steward and all those kind of things. Be a Christian and those, all those kind of things. But don't you think for five seconds they're going to bend over backwards to try to help you. Now they're, they're, they're interested in making money. Don't, don't waste your life by devoting it to someone like that. Now, I'm not advocating, you know, be a bum, don't work, and all that stuff. Obviously, you know better than that. But, but you know people, I've seen people that have done that. That's their whole life. That's it. And thank God they weren't bums and they did, they'd work and all that, but that's, that's it? That's your whole life? You got up in the morning, you went to work, and you came home, and you got something to eat, and you sat down, and you watched some news, you went to bed, and you got up, uh, you slept, then you got up in the morning, you went to work, and, or whatever swing shift, or whatever shift you worked. That's it? That's a wasted life. That's a wasted life. The Christian life is the best life. Amen. This man here in Luke chapter 12, he's, he's rich. Uh, doesn't say whether he's saved or lost. Uh, I don't know, doesn't give any occasion, I guess. I mean, I know God's not in his thoughts, and we'll deal with that in a minute. But, but uh, to me, it's a wasted life. You read in Luke chapter 16, there's another rich man there. And uh, he has pleasures, he has plenty, and he has popularity. But uh, at, the end of the, at the end of his life, what good did it do him? Uh, in Luke chapter 18, there's another rich man. He has possessions, and he has prestige. The rich young ruler, he has his health and his whole life ahead of him, but he walks away from Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 19, there's a wicked servant that shows up. Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 18, here are some men that were rich, and I know the man in 16, he goes to hell, but these two other fellows here in chapter 12 and chapter 18, I mean, whether they're saved or not, I, you know, I don't know, you take your pick, I'm not going to argue either way, that kind of thing. But I know this, the man here in Luke chapter 19, you've got a wicked servant that shows up. So what are you saying? I'm saying this, I, there's many a Christian who waste their life just like this rich man here in Luke chapter 12. Now, it may not be in the same manner as this man. This man spends all of his life uh, laboring, toiling, working, laying up, laying up, and all that stuff. And you'll see that he's not rich toward God. And again, I'm not against you laying up. I'm not against you having a good retirement. I'm not against any of that stuff. If God blesses you with it, then amen. But, and I'll say this, and I will continue to say this, if you have to leave the will of God to get it, uh, then it's wrong. Then it's wrong. All right, so let's read here. Let's, let's look at this man and look at some things about this wasted life. Luke chapter 12, and let's pick it up in verse number 13. Luke chapter 12, verse number 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. I mean, he owes me. Nobody said he owed him. There's that entitlement mentality. Isn't that amazing? That was going on back in the Lord's day. The Bible says there's no new thing under the sun, and there isn't. Human nature is just the same as it was 4,000 years ago. It's the same. 2,000 years ago, it's the same. It's still corrupt. It's still wicked. Uh, but it says, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Well, what if, what if I mean, who knows the circumstance there? Maybe, uh, you know, maybe he was like, uh, like uh, 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 the prodigal son. Maybe, maybe he lost his inheritance. I, I don't know what's going on here. And he's looking at his brother. He, hey, what he's got, he should split that with me. Because he's got more than me. <laughs> really? Look what the Lord says, verse 14. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed 
and beware of covetousness. That was the man's problem right there. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. That's a pretty clear statement. Verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, now, I want to say this too. You, this kind of preaching, you get and all this kind of stuff, that doesn't mean that if you're saved that you've got to be poor as Job's turkey, as the old expression goes, however that is. But that doesn't mean you've got to, have, you've got to be poor. Amen. For crying out loud, we live in America. Get you a job, go to work. Chances are you won't be. It's that simple. <laughs> right? Amen. And so... All this stuff these guys try to put on you and all this, if you have this or have that, that means you're wicked. No, not necessarily. All right, but there's, so there's a balance to this thing. But verse 16, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, then be merry. As someone said, and it's true, there's the American dream right there. Verse 20, But God said unto him, Look what God says, thou fool. That man's a fool. God said, you're a fool. Why, because he worked hard? No. Why, because he was industrious? No, no, that's not what God's saying. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let's keep going. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse, storehouse nor barn. And God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that which thing is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothe you, if, if God so, if then God so clothe the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will He clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not what ye, excuse me, and seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. All right, so he's telling you here, a balance, God first, God first. That's what he's trying to show you. All right, but I want to call your attention to verse, uh, I don't know, verse uh, 16 down to uh, verse 21. There's a man here who shows up. And the Lord speaks of him in a parable and uh, gives you this uh, story here of this man and uh, some of his ambition, some of his, uh, some of his life, some of his hard work, some of his labor and all that. But you look at this man and you look at all he did. And he's building barns, tearing down barns and building greater and all this industry and all this plenty and all this work and all this labor and all this toil and all this sweat and all this increase and all this good that's coming his way and all that kind of stuff and it gets all the way down to that thing and you know what this man has he's got a wasted life what a sad thing i mean the the character as far as work ethic that's in this man would we not want to see that in our kids i mean he works hard is he not and that what we teach our children work hard work hard at what you're going to do Apply yourself, so on and so forth. But this, might, but at the end of the day, it's a complete waste. What a sad thing. I mentioned to you before about a man told me one time, he said, I wasted the last 20 years. He got out of church and he was gone for 20 years. 
and he came back and he was going, coming to visitation and, and uh, we got paired up together and this and that and the other and his health was failing and different things and he couldn't run and go and do like he wanted and he wanted so bad to get back in and serve God and he did for the remainder as far as I remember, the remainder of his time as far as what he could do. But I remember, I'll never forget him telling me, he said, I've wasted the last 20 years. He looked at me and he said, hey, hey, son, he said, don't ever get out of church. Don't ever get out of fellowship with God. I've wasted the last 20 years, and I can't get it back. And we sat there and talked about that, and he said, how do you think the judgment seat of Christ is going to go for me? I'm concerned about it. I'm facing it. See, he's, he, he's down, down to the end. And he's looking back, and you know what he sees? 20 years wasted, gone. And you know as well as I do, when it's gone, you can't get it back. Listen, yesterday is gone. We can't get it back. Last week is gone. We can't get it back. Last month, this, this past year, I mean, everybody was glad to see 2020 go, but it's gone. You ain't going to get it back. The last 10 years of your life, some of you that's, you're, I don't know, close to middle age, middle age now, and you've got a couple of kids, the last 10 years, you can't get it back. It's gone. This man had a wasted life. Now let's look at some things about him and give you some things, and I'll let you go this morning. I want to give you uh, four or five things about him and then maybe uh, counter those with four or five more. <laughs> don't worry, we won't be that long. Uh, but I want to say this, number one, you notice verse 16, he has the blessings of God on him. As far as physically and all that kind of stuff, there's no doubt God blessed this man. I mean, physically, I mean, you can say he's Old Testament Jew, whatever. I'm not going to get into all that as far as the doctrinal thing of that. Uh, but there's no doubt, look at verse 16, he spoke a parallel him saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. I mean, he's able to work. There's no question about it. This man is able to work so physically, probably in good health and all that stuff, and able to work and is working hard, probably sun up to sun down. He's industrious. He's, he's, he's not lazy. He's a go-getter. All those kind of things. Maybe smart with his money. Maybe smart with his investment and all that. But there's no doubt about it. It, it would appear that God has blessed this man physically. Physically. Now, I'm, you know, we won't get into this uh, real deep and all that, but, you know, we live in America. There's no doubt we've experienced blessings. God has blessed this nation. God has blessed this country. <clears throat> I mean, I look around the room, most of us, maybe not all of us, but most of us, you got one or two cars. You got a decent home to live in. Amen. You're not living under a bridge somewhere and all that kind of stuff. I mean, think uh, you got your health about you, you got your mind and faculties about you and all that. Uh, and I know to one degree or another, and here there's physical problems and whatnot, and different things like that. All I'm simply saying is this uh, you, looking at your life, you probably can look back and somewhere God blessed you with whatever. You had God's blessings. Now, speaking for myself, I mean, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, I've been blessed. I've been blessed beyond measure. And I, I, that's not a boastful thing. I mean, that, that humbles me when I think about it. Wife was, and I was talking the other day, talking about some people that got some sicknesses and diseases, some of them dying in their 40s. Someone was talking about a guy uh, uh, goes to some church over here in Fairfield, about 40 years old or so, maybe even younger, uh, got COVID or something, and gone. He's on his way out. What a thing. And here I stand, healthy, maybe a few little aches and pains every now and then from, from my youth, if you will. <laughs> but for the most part, I feel good. Amen. Thank God. God's blessed us. God's, God's given us a, 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 a nice home and all that, more than I ever thought I'd ever dreamed I'd ever have. That's, that's not a braggadocious thing. That's a, look what God has done. I can't believe it. 
I can't believe it. Listen, I, and I know to one degree there's others got stuff a whole lot nicer and all that and got finer cars and finer homes and all finer clothes. Whatever, I don't care about all that. I'm just saying as far as I see it, in my mind, God has blessed me. And I'm thankful. He's blessed me physically. Not only that, but I want to say this about this man, not only to bless him physically, but it, it, not just a little bit. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. Plentifully. And you can see from the passage, he's, oh man, I don't know where to put all this stuff. Kind of like your garage. Where do we put all this stuff? Right? Where do we put all this, this junk? My, my thought, my mind is, hey, I mean, we still haven't got everything unpacked from moving. My mind is, if we have, it's been a year, we don't, haven't got unpacked, we must not need it. Let's just throw it away. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> eh, maybe not for some of you wives. You'd say, oh, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. But I don't know, we ain't used it in a year. Well, I have it. Plenty. We live in the land of plenty. We, we throw away more. <laughs> Look at the food that's thrown away in this country. Just the food. Just, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad for living in America. You know, you white privilege, shame on you. No, man, it's where God, it's where God put you. Amen. Amen? Thank God for the blessings. Use it for His glory. Use it for His honor and go on and serve God. Don't let this crowd make you feel bad. Somebody say amen right there, please. Amen. I get tired of that stuff. But God does bless this man physically. And he blesses him with plenty, there's no question God has blessed him. Now let's go a little bit deeper. Look at verse 16, 17. We read verse 16. Uh, here's the ground of a certain rich man and brings forth plentifully. Look at verse 17. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. All right, here, where is, it, 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 this is where it kind of takes a turn. This is just kind of where it takes a turn. Right here, he becomes busy. Oh, no. What am I going to do? What am I going to do with all this stuff that God has blessed me with? What, what am I going to do with it all? How am I going to take care of it all? He got real busy right about this time. He became busy. You know, there's some Christians that will be in church this morning. You know why they're not here? Simple fact, they got busy. They got busy. They got busy in the wrong places. What do you mean they got busy? Well, prosperity, prosperity became the priority with this man here. Prosperity became the priority. Did you hear what I said? Again, now look, I'm not against working hard and making money and all that, and, and you know that. This, I, I would hope you know that. But, when it come, but if it becomes a priority, that's a problem. At least if it's the priority. Amen. If it's the top priority. No, God should be the top priority. Amen. Amen. And whatever you can earn or get or whatever you can do within the parameters of serving God and His will, knock yourself out. Have at it. My wife and I was talking about some of this stuff just the other day. But with this man, the pros his prosperity became his priority. This was now his baby. This was his baby. This was first. Everything else took a back seat, at least all indication. I mean, by the time he got up, I mean, he had to make sure that, that the tractor was running good, that the, the, the fertilizer was in the ground, that, uh, that the, the, the barns were taken care of, everything was put away properly, everything is taken care of, that work is going forward, and progress is being made. Prosperity became his priority. I don't know, maybe he even began to go out of his way to read and research and study and how to produce more and more and more and more to get more bang out of his buck. It became his priority. Again, all that stuff is fine in its place. But he got real busy with it. And you know what happens to Christians? They get real busy with it. I'm talking about a wasted life. They get real busy with all that stuff. And next thing you know, you look back, 10 years goes by, and not one soul won for Jesus Christ. 
You haven't read your Bible through one time in 10 years. And you look at it and you go, well, I just, preacher, I just, I just don't have time. Why not? Why not? I'm working, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and you don't have no time for God? None? In all your labor and all your toil, you can't win somebody to Jesus Christ that you're laboring next to, or at least try? Or put out some trucks, put a hundred out uh, a year? I'm, I'm, I'm saying, this man did nothing. Everything he did was his priority was his prosperity. That was his priority. To have a better farm. To have a bigger barn. To have a better tractor. One that could produce more. It just goes and goes and goes and goes. Let me tell you something. You, you get running that rabbit, you'll never find it. You never achieve that. You never can have enough. When the priority becomes, the prosperity becomes the priority, you can never have enough. Never. The eyes of man are never satisfied. That's what the Bible says. All right, so his prosperity became his priority. Not only that, his problems, his problems become his priority. Look at verse 17, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Now, let me ask you, is that a problem? Although that may be a good problem, is that a problem? I got all this harvest, I got nowhere to put it. Is that a problem? Yes, that's a problem. Is that a good problem in general? Yes, but in this case, his problem, not only has prosperity become his priority, which in turn now there's problems due to that. I said there's problems that result from that, and now those problems become his priority. When your problems become your priority, something's wrong. I'm not belittling them. I'm not saying they're not real. I'm not saying they're not huge and they're not monumental. But God is to be first. God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is to be first. Not your problem. Maybe God is working, got His hand in your problem. Maybe, maybe God was trying to slow this man down somehow. Maybe God was trying to turn his thought. Maybe God was saying, hey, why don't you give some of this to some of my people that need it? I don't know. I'm, God blessed him. And I'm not saying, you know, share the wealth. I'm not saying that either. But I'm just simply saying, you don't know what God's doing. Problem comes your way. God can use that problem to turn you. You need turn sometimes. And in turn, instead of turning to God, turning for God's face, turning to seek God's direction and God's discernment, the problem consumes you. And the problem becomes at the forefront. And the problem, listen, this, is, this happens to all of us. And, 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 and next thing you know, it is priority. And you live your life taking care of this problem. Or trying to take care of that problem. His problem became priority. Someone said, why pray when you can worry? <laughs> right? Why pray when you can worry? Now, uh, and say this, Dr. Ruckman is talking about some of the stuff. I've said this before, but uh, he's preaching on some of this thing of anxiety and stress and all this stuff. And he said, don't ever worry about two things. Don't ever worry about what you can help. If you can help it, then take care of it and move on. Right? And he said, don't ever worry about what you can help and don't ever worry about what you can't help. If you can't do anything about it, then you can't do anything about it. You're going to have to trust God. As a matter of fact, in both cases, you're going to have to trust the Lord. Right? He said, that's just, oh, that's way too simple. Uh, it may be, but it'll help you sleep at night. Amen. Amen. This man's, I'm just saying, this man's problem became his priority. He had to take care of that. 
and which leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to another. It never stops. It's a domino effect. All right, he became, and what happens? He's just busy. He's busy. Not a lazy man, not a slothful man. You can't condemn him for that. You can't say he's, uh, you know, a, a sot or a drunk or, or sorry or anything like that. He, this man is a, he's a hard-working man, but he's too busy. He's too busy. You can be too busy. You know that? We talk about laziness as far as being a sin and all that. And, and I, who was it? Bob Jones Sr. got that plaque out there in your, uh, your room. It's a, Bob Jones Sr. said it's a sin to do less than your best. There's some truth to that. And the laziness and all that. But you know something? You can carry that thing too far too. The other way. You know your body needs rest. Your body needs sleep. And, and for you to burn the candle at both ends, you know what that is? For a Christian, you know what that is? That's a sin. Yeah, but I got to, I got to, I got to, I got to. Okay, why? I mean, stop and evaluate the circumstance. Stop and evaluate the situation. Christians get themselves in messes all the time financially. Bite off more they can chew, if you will. And what happens? Next thing you know, you become way too busy, ain't got time for God. Ain't got, don't have time for any kind of fellowship with God other than Sunday morning. You're too busy. I'll say this even. You know something? Even in the service of God, you can be too busy. I've mentioned this, but I'll say it again. You know what I've had to learn now that I'm married and got a family, got some kids at home and all that? You know what I've learned? I can't just run and go and run and go and run and go and run and go. Why? There's got to be a balance. I can be too busy, so busy serving God. Serving God, studying, uh, preparing, uh, praying, uh, 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 visiting, all those kind of things, and neglect my family. Was that right to neglect my family? Hello? Would it be right to neglect my family? No, it's not, is it? But it's, neither is it right to neglect the service of God. What? There has to be a balance with that thing. But I can be so busy over here. Or for that matter, I can be so busy over here where I neglect the service of God. Just trying to do what God told me to do, take care of my family. Preacher, I've got to take care of my family. There's a balance to it all. He became busy. You see the blessings of God on him. He becomes so busy. He don't have time for God. Number three. I mean, I wonder. I wonder if he ever prayed before he went out the door. I wonder if he ever saw God's discernment. Okay, Lord, should I buy that 40 acres over there and plant some more? I wonder if he ever, I wonder if he ever, I wonder, I wonder if that was ever a consideration. I wonder if I should buy more ground. I wonder, Lord, do you really want me to buy, build a bigger barn? Or should I just put the brakes on a little bit and be content with such things as you have? Ouch. Yeah, I know. Make you busy. All right, he became busy. Number three, are you still with me? All right, number three. Number three. He began building. Verse 17 and 18. Verse 17, and he thought with himself, saying, What shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? 18. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Sound doctrine. Gary Duty has got a song called Building Bigger Barns. Real good song. Some people spend their whole life building bigger barns. That's the gist of it. They spend their whole life building bigger barns. And what happens? It's a wasted life. He began to build. Now, you see in verse 17 and 18, he's thinking, <clears throat> he's thinking ahead. Is it good to think ahead? Yes. Is that not good? Is it good to think ahead and to plan for some future events? I understand what he's saying in the rest of the passage here, and I read that on purpose. Some people say, well, is the Lord just telling you here just to throw it all to the wind and live in the day and the moment? No, he's telling you to put God first. That's what he's telling you. 
and he's telling you to have some faith in God, secondly. God, God's, not, God's not the author of confusion. It's not this thing where you can't plan. It's not this, listen, if, I mean, if, if God's put you in a place like this, a Miltonville Baptist church, and you're in this church, and you're a member of this church, and maybe you have a, a position or an office or whatever it is, or a church member, whatever it is, and you're doing what God told you to do, and, and you're working, and you've got your family, and this and that and the other, another run, and this is where God's put you, and as far as you know, I mean, uh, God's no foreseeable future where God's going to move you to a different place or do this or do that. I mean, what's wrong? There's nothing wrong with looking ahead and thinking ahead to prepare and take care of your family. There's nothing wrong with that. There's not a thing wrong with that. But he began to plan, and he's planning. This is what I'll do. Look what it says. Verse 17, he thought within himself, saying, here he goes, Verse 18, and he said, this will I do. He didn't pray about it one time. He doesn't see God's face one time. I'm saying this, he begins to build and he's planned, he's doing all this planning without the Lord, without the direction of the Lord, without any discernment from God. He doesn't consult, uh, 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 seek God's counsel. He doesn't sit down. He doesn't hit his knees. He don't build an altar. He don't do anything. He just, that's what I think I'll do. I mean, business is good, so. I mean, things are good right now, so. I mean, I'm busy. I can't, I can't let this go to waste. I mean, that's a, that's a sin to let it go to waste. I mean, you got to get it when the getting's good, preacher. Yeah, I know, but be careful. preacher told me about a, a good friend of mine just the other day. It broke my heart. I said, how's old brother so-and-so doing? Man, I, I love that guy. He said, well, and then he kind of looked out the window. And I thought, oh, no. I said, what? He said, yeah. Yeah. He said, busy, brother. He's busy. Making money. You don't know him, so <laughs> busy making money. He began to build, he began to plan and do all this without the direction of God. Can I say, you don't want to waste your life. You better seek God's direction. How do you prevent that? You seek God's face. You go God's direction. You go God's way. You, you, listen, God might have had a different plan for this man. No doubt he probably would have. But he never cons uh, uh, counseled God. He never consoled, uh, consul uh, never, what's the word? Consulted God one time. He never prayed. He never asked. He never sought God's direction, never sought God's will. He began building without God's direction. You begin building, you get halfway going. You know what's going to happen? You're going to want to finish. It takes time to finish. Sometimes you build, you know what happens? It takes a lifetime sometimes to build something. Sometimes it takes a long time to build something. You know what the Bible calls us over there in 1 Corinthians 3? Wise master builders. You know what you are? God's husbandry. You're God's building. That's what it says. You know what you're doing? You're building, whether you realize it or not. What's he say over there? Therefore, take heed how you build, how you labor. You're building. You're building something. Whether you want to admit it or not, you're building something. All right, so what are you saying? I'm saying this. When you start building... You better plan. You better, you better seek God's face. He doesn't do that. Spends, a whole, spends his whole life wasting, building something maybe God didn't even want him to build. All right, number four. Number four, I've got to hurry. Number, he's, not only does he see the blessings of God, he becomes busy. He begins to build. I want to say this, verse 19. Look at verse 19. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He's blinded by stuff. He's blinded by all the 
all his fruits and all of his goods and all of his big barns and all of his... He's blinded by all that. reminds me of Hezekiah. The Lord gives him extra time and all that stuff. And those guys come over there. They saw the, the, the phenomena in the, in, the, in the heavens. And so they come to seek out what's going on. Let's figure out and see what them Jews are doing over there and, and all that. And they come over there and Hezekiah takes them and he shows them this and he shows them that and he shows them this and he shows them that. And never one time does he point this way. Never one time. And all that stuff, all of his armor and all of his gold and all of his palace and all of the things that God blessed him with. And he, he's walking around even himself been blessed with extra life. Never one time, never one time does he point up. Why? He's blinded. This man's blind. You know what some Christians are? They're blinded by all their stuff, whether it's will, willful or deceptive. They're blinded. I've got to take care of it, preacher. I mean, God blessed me with this. I've got to take care of it. I, like, I still like what the old preacher said. People talking about, you know, my ox is in the ditch. I've got to take care of it. He said, if your ox is always in the ditch, let me give you some advice. Number one, fill up the ditch or sell the stupid ox. You know there's some truth in that? But no, this man's blinded. His possessions begin to possess him. His possessions begin to possess him. They dictated his life. His possessions dictated his life every week. It dictated his schedule. His possessions did. Now, I, I say, I do believe, listen, I do believe that if God's blessed you with something, take care of it. If God's blessed you with something, take care of it. But I'll tell you one thing. I am, listen, if you stay home to cut your grass on Sunday, God, God help you. Shame on you. Hey, and I know it's Sunday and you're here. Amen. Thank God and all that. But I'm just so behind, preacher. I got to cut my, no, it'll, it'll wait. Well, it's going to rain. So what? Let it grow. God's more important than some grass. God's more important than how well it looks or how bad it looks. I, again, I'm not telling you to let it, you know, grow over your house, you know, where all the neighbors are complaining. You got thorns and thistles all growed up and all that, and you're getting letters from the city. Cut your grass or we're going to come and cut it. I understand all that. But God needs to be first. He was blinded by stuff. His possessions begin to possess him. You're going to stay home and whack your car? Or what? I'm just throwing some things out there. Whatever it might be. I mean, whatever it might be. Blinded by stuff. I want to say this. His passion was misplaced. You know what happened? He began to love this stuff. He began to love it. He began to love it and put it to a place in his heart. It had a place in his heart where it should not have been. And it wasted his life. Not only is it, you see, the blessings of God, he became busy, he began to build, he was blinded by his stuff, and because of all that, and his possessions possessed him, and his passion is misplaced, he commits and has one of the greatest blunders that's ever seen. Verses 19, 20, and 21. And I will say to my soul, so thou as much goes later for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? He's a fool. God calls him a fool. He calls a hard-working man a fool. Did you hear what I said? He calls a hard-working man a fool. Why? Because his passion is misplaced. His priorities are wrong. Oh, but he's a good old boy. God said, you're a fool. That's a thought, isn't it? I wonder how many of Americans would fall in that category. How many Christian Americans would fall into that category? Just a good old hard-working boy, you know. Yeah, but he ain't got no time for God at all. God says, you're a fool. His passion was misplaced. It commits the greatest blunder 
that, that you could imagine and see one of the greatest blunders in the world. A wasted life. A wasted life. His provision was wrong. His piety. His piety was without. What's piety? Piety is a reverence for God or devout fulfillment or obligation. He had no piety whatsoever. None. You know what this man loved? I'll tell you what he loved. He loved himself first. How do I know? Look at verse 17. What shall I do? Look at verse 18. This will I do. I will pull down my barns. There will I bestow all my fruits. Verse 19. And I will say to my soul. Can you not see that? He loves himself. Look at what I've built. Look, look at all that I have done. Whether it's earthly materials or the work of God. He's building and loves himself. And God gets down to the end of that thing. And he's down to the end. And God's getting ready to take him out. And God says, buddy, you're a fool. Look at 21. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Are you rich toward God? That's a fair question. Are you? You. Member, not member, whatever of this church. Are you rich toward God? Now cut all the modesty, cut all the, the pious thing about it. Just look at it. Uh, analytically, just look at it honestly, straight as it is, not know this super humble, are you rich toward God? I'm not saying you've got to be ultra super spiritual Christian, none of that stuff. I'm simply saying, this morning, are you rich toward God? Or do you have a wasted life? What was the problem with this man? Number one, he neglected the Savior. Number two, he neglected his soul. Number three, he neglected the service of God. Number four, he neglected the supplications to God. That's prayer. He neglected, number five, he neglects the Scriptures. So what am I saying? What am I saying? I'm, saying? I'm simply saying this. And it's not just a bunch of things you must do, 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 and all that. I'm saying this. He neglected, he neglected, are you listening? He neglected eternal things. That's the bottom line right there. He neglected the eternal things. Everything this man did, his entire life was centered and spent. All of his energy, his mind, his strength, all of that stuff that he's supposed to love God with first was spent on temporal things instead of eternal things. And you know what Christians are doing today? Their whole mindset is on temporal things. God bless me with this. God bless me with that. God give me, God give me, God give me. Now listen, I, you're told to ask for that stuff, whatever. I understand all that. But when that is the focal point, Instead of God, you're first. What do you want? What do you want? Should I build or should I not? Should I store up more or should I not? Should I buy the lower 40 or should I just till what I got here? Plant what I got here. Reap what I got here. Any excess, it's yours anyway, God. This whole, this whole farm belongs to you. What, are, what do you want me to do with it? How can I use this for you? God, order my steps. I need to do some planning here. I'm at a fork in the road. I need some direction here, God. What, what, what do you want? Instead of making a wrong turn without even giving God five seconds. Without giving God more than a 20 second prayer on an altar. 
and he go, takes off. You know what he does? And he wastes. I don't know how old this man is, but he's a wasted life. It's gone. And once it's gone, you can't get it back. Now, having said that, I'm done. I told the men yesterday at the prison, I was preaching, and I've, I've made statements here about it, but I'll say it again. You know, I, and, and it's, again, please don't misunderstand it, take it the wrong way. It's not in a braggadocious way at all. I'm just, I'm thankful. In his last hours of his life, in the last week of his life, I'm glad I was in a position. I'm glad God had had me in a place to where when He gave me the nod, you go. I'm glad I had the means. I'm glad I was able to go. I'm glad I went. Looking back on that, what a waste it would have been. I don't have time right now. I've got to cut my grass. You say, oh, God would have got somebody else. Maybe not. You don't know that. I got to do this. I don't have time right now. I gotta, I'm doing some research. I'm glad, I'm glad I went that night, that Saturday night, whatever night that was, 11 o'clock at night. I'm glad I went back those two or three days. I look back and I say, Glory to God. I sure am glad. I sure am glad when someone walked up to me on a Sunday and they said, hey, he lives over here in such and such. Would you, would you care to go see him? He's requesting that a preacher come see him. I'm glad that, I'm glad that little piece of paper came my way. I'm glad I went and knocked on the door. We. Oui. I'm glad that when he called and, and said, hey, after he, after he had gotten saved, he called me and he said, hey, I'm looking for that verse that you gave me that told me I was going to get my legs back. I can't find it. I'm glad I took the time. I'm glad we was up there at the hospital and, and uh, walked in. He's sitting there with one of those heart pillows on his chest, you know. They just got done cutting him open. <laughs> he was eating up with cancer. Said, you ain't got long for this world. Got the witness and told him they got saved right there in the hospital. And from all apparent things and all that, I don't know how his home life was, but after, after all that stuff and now looking back, <laughs> probably was a mess. But I know where he's at tonight, today. I'm glad I went back out uh, sometime, you know, afterwards and seen him and prayed with him and talked to him and his boys and his wife said, he's changed. Even though it's at the end of his life and he went out to meet God, saved. I sure am glad, I'm, I'm sure I'm glad I didn't say, I built a barn. I don't have time. I, I'm tearing down a barn to build a bigger barn. <laughs> Amen. Now, that's, I'm not trying to do this because there's places where I can look back and I said, boy, I sure wish I would have. But I'm trying to point out some things where followed the Lord's lead and, man, God sure did bless. And not looking ahead, looking, at, looking, up, looking ahead, looking out into eternity, Looking out, looking out, looking ahead, looking for that day when the Lord does descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God sounds and in a moment, twinkling of an eye, we're changed and we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And, and there we are. And I, I swear I'm glad I went. I'm glad, I'm glad that some way, somehow, look back and it all ain't a waste. I got to thinking about that. I made a statement yesterday at the prison, and I don't know why I said it, but I did. I said, telling the men, I said, you know, <clears throat> um, we've been coming to this prison now. I've been coming to this prison now almost 30 years. 
And the, and the thought dawned on me as I'm standing there behind the pulpit after making that statement and talking, but you know, you think, and, and the thought goes to my head, 30 years, is it really worth it? I'm glad I went. I'm glad I took some guys with me. I mean, it might not be a complete 100% success with everything and all that stuff, but the preaching went out, the Word of God was planted, the seeds were sown. A chaplain, a chaplain who has a charismatic background is now asking questions. <laughs> is it really worth it? I don't know how many men have been saved over there and all that. I'm just simply saying, I'm glad. I can look back and it ain't all a waste. That ain't all a waste. I think about times coming in here and praying on Saturday morning and then Sunday rolls around and see God answer a prayer and I go, look at that. Or sometime through that week, God will answer a prayer and I look at that and I go, look at that. That time that you spent on your knees was not wasted. It was not wasted. We've developed a mentality to take time to stop and pray. We don't have time for that because, let's just face it, our heart, in our heart, we ain't got time right now. It's a, there's other things more important. Something down inside there says, ah, this is more of a waste. No, it's not. No, it's not. That thing balanced out the Christian spending some time in prayer. There's never a moment spending prayer that I've regretted. I wish I hadn't prayed that. I wish I hadn't I wish I hadn't prayed, you know, man, God answered another prayer. I'm glad it all ain't a waste. Amen. What are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life? Playing video games? If you've got time for that and you can make time for that, fine, help yourself. I don't have time for that. But you know what some people are doing? They're wasting their life in front of a screen. Man, these graphics are cool. Okay, if you're 14 or 12 or whatever, I get it. But if you're wasting your life in front of a screen... What someone said or someone didn't say or how many likes or dislikes you got. What a waste. What a waste. Who was it? C.T. Studd or one of those guys? You know the quote. Only what's done or only one life. Uh, how's it go? I forgot how it goes. One life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's it, man. That's it. You get that judgment seat, Lord piles it all up, only what's done for Christ is going to last. The rest of this stuff ain't going to matter. It ain't going to matter. In the light of the judgment seat of Christ and eternity's day and the eternal light, all the temporal stuff, it ain't going to matter. What someone said about you uh, to cause you to quit going to church, it ain't going to matter. You're going to waste your life over what some Christian says or thinks or has a bad attitude or you're going to waste your life. Christians do. Waste it. Some of you might remember Dr. Homer Smith. He used to come here and preach. He'd preach. He'd do that all the time when he'd preach. He'd, he'd get to preach and preach and preach and preach and he'd catch his breath and then he'd preach again. And he'd give his invitations and all that. And I always remember, some of you sitting here, you remember. And he'd always, when he'd get down preaching to Christians, he'd always get to preaching to Christians and he'd say, how many of you sitting here, how many of you sitting here would say, I want my life to count for the cause of Christ. Remember that? 
Meet you right now, right now. How many of you are sitting out here, heads bowed, eyes closed? How many of you are sitting out here right now and say, Preacher, I want my life to count for the cause of Christ? Well, do you? I hope you do. I think you do. But maybe you're sitting here right now. I don't know. Maybe you're on the fence. <laughs> How are you going to go out? A wasted life? That man went out, a wasted life. The Reverend James Harris, 77 years old, <clears throat> of Orion's, Illinois, collapsed and died at the end of his sermon in a county home for the aged. <laughs> These guys preaching in a nursing home. 77 years old, collapses at the end of his sermon. With his last breath, he said, I have just one more point to make, and then I'll close. <laughs> You're saying that's going. To, that's what's going to happen to you. Maybe, but you know what he did? He went out. <laughs> I don't know if I want to go out in the pulpit or not. That'd be terrible for you people. Amen. Oh, my last fond memories of the preacher. He collapsed and it was ugly. Should have seen it. But you know what he did? Say what you want to. He went out swinging the sword. He went out preaching. He went out trying to please his Savior. He went out with a life that meant something, that was meaningful, that had some substance to it, that was worth living. It was not just a waste. Amen. Let's stand for prayer.